Welcome to this video based on a lecture that I did in the C.S. Lewis Festival in Belfast in 2018. Since then, there's been a movie about the life of J.R.R. Tolkien or his early life. It was great, but it had some factual inaccuracies in it. So I really wanted to repost the video and look a bit at an amazing factor of Tolkien's life. That was his friendship with C.S. Lewis. So I've called my lecture, Tollers and Jack, The Myths of J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, both because they wrote in the form of myths in the stories that they told, but also because the writers themselves have been mythologized to a certain extent. And I believe that as I tell this story, you're going to see two very different men than the men you might expect me to describe. So I'm going to start with a quiz like I did in the live lecture. So let's see how well you do in this quiz, how much you know about Tolkien and Lewis already. OK, who said, I am a Christian and of course what I write will be from that essential viewpoint. Was that J.R.R. Tolkien or C.S. Lewis? And it was, of course, J.R.R. Tolkien interviewed by the American scholar Clyde Kilby. Next question. He put away three pints in a very short session we had this morning and said he was going short for Lent. Is that Lewis on Tolkien or Tolkien on Lewis? And that is Tolkien on Lewis. So he wrote a letter to his son, Christopher Tolkien, in March 1944, in which he said, Lewis is getting too much publicity for any of our tastes. Peterborough did him the doubtful honour of a peculiarly misrepresentative and asinine paragraph in the Daily Telegraph. It began, ascetic, Mr. Lewis, I ask you. He put away three pints in a very short session we had this morning and said he was going short for Lent. Now, C.S. Lewis did like the odd tipple, and on occasions it got him into trouble, which we'll see a little bit later on. But you'll also notice from this letter, firstly, that Lewis's friends are not reacting well to his growing celebrity. Of course, Tolkien didn't become a celebrity until after Lewis's death, when Lord of the Rings hit very big in America. So it also shows us that Lewis was almost being mythologized in his own life. He's being described as an ascetic, and that's like a public perception of him, which really didn't reflect the real man. I fell deeply under the spell of dwarfs, the old bright hooded snowy bearded dwarfs we had in those days before Arthur Rackham sublimed or Walt Disney vulgarized the Earthman. So who is this writing? Is it Lewis or is it Tolkien? It is C.S. Lewis who wrote this in Surprised by Joy. There's no harm in him. He only needs a smack or two. Is that Tolkien on Lewis or Lewis on Tolkien? Lewis wrote this in his diary on the night he first met Tolkien at a meeting of the staff of the Oxford English School in 1926, when he was still relatively new to the department. They disagreed at that point on how literature and language should be taught, but in the end they were really of a mind and on the same team. And Lewis was instrumental in helping Professor Tolkien implement a new curriculum for the School of English. Who was Merton College Oxford Chair of English Language and Literature? Was that J.R.R. Tolkien or was it C.S. Lewis? And the answer is, it was Tolkien. He was higher up the academic tree than Lewis was, pretty much for the whole of Lewis's career. So Tolkien had held this position from 1945 until he retired in 1959. He had previously been chair of medieval literature at Oxford and he had voted for C.S. Lewis as his replacement, but Lewis was passed over and he also missed out in the position of professor of poetry. Now this was unusual because in Oxford, Tolkien was actually known as the Lord of the Strings for his ability to get people into the posts he wanted them to be in, but it didn't work out on this occasion and that was partly due to Lewis's growing celebrity as a fantasy novelist and a Christian apologist, not necessarily because of his work or because of his faith, but being a celebrity was not considered very academic in certain circles. He was eventually appointed chair of medieval and Renaissance literature at Magdalene College in Cambridge, and actually C.S. Lewis was one of the electors to that post. That was in 1954, although he kept his house in Oxford, which was very much his spiritual home. And he travelled there at the weekends, retiring due to ill health in 1963, the year that he died. 
I miss you very much. Very emotionally open here. So who is this? Is it Tolkien writing to Lewis or Lewis writing to Tolkien? This is Lewis writing to Tolkien in a letter dated 1963, very sadly in the year that he died. At that point, their friendship had cooled off. And we'll have a little look at what led up to that a little later. So which of these popular fantasy works was first sold in a Christian bookshop as a specifically religious work? Was it the Chronicles of Narnia or was it the Lord of the Rings? Seems a bit like a no-brainer, doesn't it? The answer is the Lord of the Rings. In a letter to a family friend, Reverend Robert Murray, in December 1953, Tolkien responded to Murray's comments that the figure of Galadriel was reminiscent of the Virgin Mary by saying, the Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the revision. That is why I have not put in or have cut out practically all references to anything like religion, to cults or practices in the imaginary world. For the religious element is absorbed into the symbolism. And we can see here some beautiful images from the Peter Jackson movies of The Lord of the Rings, which definitely are very biblical. Who is the most prolific Christian author of the 20th century? Is that J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and of course there were others, Evelyn Waugh or T.S. Eliot? And the answer is debatable. C.S. Lewis's work is very clearly Christian, and especially since he was an apologist and his non-literary work is based around Christian apologetics. So very clearly a Christian writer, whereas in the case of Tolkien, although he asserted himself that all his work came from the essential viewpoint of Christianity, not all readers actually see that in his work. In fact, Ian McKellen commented on the release of The Fellowship of the Ring, the movie, that the best thing about Middle Earth is that there is no God in it. Now, that is his own personal reaction to the movie and he actually has a degree in English from Cambridge so he knows about literature but ironically in 1955 Tolkien had written to his publishers that the only criticism that annoyed me about The Lord of the Rings was that it contained no religion. It is a monotheistic world of natural theology. Natural theology in that you don't need to go to church because your day-to-day -day life is the living out of your faith. Your spiritual beliefs are just part of your intrinsic experience. In terms of sheer numbers, if we're looking at who's the most successful author, last time I looked, Tolkien's works had sold 200 million copies and Lewis's 100 million copies. Now, the Harry Potter books have sold 500 million copies um, upon last checking, which was about a year ago, just to put that in context. Um, Lewis was a celebrity author, as I was mentioning earlier, during their friendship. He was the successful writer. Tolkien actually only achieved the fame that he did as an author, that sort of juggernaut of The Lord of the Rings, began to gather pace after Lewis's death. If you bore me, I shall take my revenge. Is that Lewis writing to Tolkien or Tolkien writing to Lewis? And that is actually Tolkien writing to Lewis as part of an apology letter. Odd way to apologise, but that's how they ruled. Now, I've got some audio clips of Tolkien and Lewis. There is no trick questions here. You're going to know instantly who is who when you listen to their voices. I have always, for some reason, I don't know why, I'm enormously attracted by trees. All oh, my works is full of trees. I suppose I have actually had some simple-minded all along. I actually would like to... I should have liked to be able to make contact with the tree and find out what it feels about things. <laughs> so J.R.R. Tolkien, I think the picture gives it away, softly spoken, slightly rambling, slightly tangential, whereas this is what C.S. Lewis sounded like. In these talks, I've had to say a good deal about prayer. And before going on to my main subject tonight, 
I'd like to deal with a difficulty some people find about the whole idea of prayer. Somebody put it to me by saying, I can believe in God all right, but what I can't swallow is this idea of him listening to several hundred million human beings who are all addressing him at the same moment. And I find quite a lot of people feel that difficulty. That is the voice of C.S. Lewis. So you can hear my Northern Irish accent. He does not sound like a boy from Belfast, does he? Although apparently he could do a Northern Irish accent brilliantly, especially if there was some comedic reason for doing it. And when he came home for visits, he could quite easily slip back into the accent. But he was, of course, mostly educated in England and his real spiritual home was Oxford. So let's look at this beautiful story of J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. What was it that brought these two seemingly very different men together? What was it that separated them? And why is it that even to this day, if you Google one, you'll find images of the other? They're so inseparable in the public consciousness. So let's look at the end of the story first, strange as that might sound. This is a letter that J.R.R. Tolkien wrote to his daughter Priscilla a few days after the death of C.S. Lewis, four days after the death. Dearest, thank you so much for your letter. So far I have felt the normal feelings of a man of my age, like an old tree that is losing all its leaves one by one. This feels like an axe blow near the roots. Very sad that we should have been so separated in the last years, but our time of close communion endured a memory for both of us. I had a mass said this morning and was there and served. The funeral at Holy Trinity, the church which Jack attended, was quiet and attended only by intimates and some maudlin people, including the president. The grave is under a larch in the corner of the churchyard. Douglas Gresham was the only family mourner. Warney was not present, alas. Um, there will be an official memorial service in Maudlin on Saturday at 2.15. It was very sweet of you, my dearest, to write, God bless you, Daddy. So this is how Tolkien felt days after the loss of a man who had been what in a Celtic tradition we would call an Anamkara, someone who is such a close friend, they're like a spirit friend. You'll notice that Tolkien specifically mentions that C.S. Lewis is buried under a larch tree. Now, if you're familiar with the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, you'll know how important trees are to him. Um, he has in the Silmarillion two trees that are very reminiscent of the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Bible, in the Eden story. And so trees to J.R.R. Tolkien very much represent spirituality. And of course, he personified C.S. Lewis in The Lord of the Rings as Treebeard with a deep boom booming voice, which was something that C.S. Lewis was famous for. So it would have been comforting to Tolkien that his great friend is buried underneath a tree. And I think even the images that he uses of himself as a tree, an old tree losing all its leaves one by one. This is an axe blow near the roots. So really, really deep grief at the loss of a man whom he hadn't really been close to for about 10 years at that point. So we're going to have a little look at how this friendship grew, what brought these men together and what it was that separated them and how we arrive at this moment of terrible grief. So Robert Havard, who was Lewis's doctor and was also a member of the Inklings, which was a literary society in Oxford, which both Lewis and Tolkien frequented. So he commented that they were two very different men. Lewis was a big, full-blown man, overbearing almost, both in the weight of his personality and his physical weight. Tolkien was a slight figure. I'd say three quarters the weight of Lewis. His whole manner was elusive rather than direct. His remarks were always made by the way and not with a knock you down, take them or leave them attitude, whereas Lewis came straight at you. The surprising thing really is that they became such close friends rather than that differences appeared and separated them. So let's consider how it was that these two men became such close friends. 
Let's look at what had happened before they met. So John Ronald Rule Tolkien was born on the 3rd of January 1892 in Bloemfontein, South Africa. So J.R.R. Tolkien sounds very... It's, it's an almost mythic name, isn't it? Um, but actually, he was just John or John Ronald to his family and friends. They moved to England, age three, with his mother, Mabel, who was previously Mabel Suffield, and his younger brother, Hilary. Their father, before he can join them, unfortunately dies of rheumatic fever. So the family left in financial dire straits, move in with Mabel's parents in Kings Heath, Birmingham, and then they move to Serhole, a Worcestershire village, which is very widely believed to be the, the kind of forerunner of the Shire in Tolkien's imagination, a beautiful bucolic English village. And he didn't so much like the industrial landscape of Birmingham. So Mabel Tolkien converted to Catholicism in 1890 and her Baptist family cut her off without a penny. She died at the age of 34 of type 1 diabetes. At that point, John Ronald was 12 years old. So this was his reaction to his mother's death. My own dear mother was a martyr indeed, and it is not everybody that God grants so easy a way to his great gifts as he did to Hilary and me, giving us a mother who killed herself with labour and trouble to ensure us keeping the faith. So Tolkien was very sensitive to any kind of anti-Catholic prejudice for the rest of his life, and he viewed his mother as a martyr. Now, she had been treated badly, um, but realistically she had type 1 diabetes in the days before insulin was widely available i myself have type 1 diabetes um and so nothing really could have saved her life although undoubtedly her last days with these two young boys without money were very difficult and the church was a very big support to the family at that time and also during that time, Mabel had taught John Ronald Latin and had ensured that he read various types of literature. He particularly liked the works of a guy called George MacDonald, whom we're going to find out a little bit about later. After his mother's death, Father Francis Morgan became the Tolkien brothers' guardian. So he sent to King Edward School in Birmingham. Now, this is not a private school of the likes that C.S. Lewis went to. This is a grammar school, but it's a very good grammar school and Tolkien did well there. He was very academic. He was a member of a group dedicated to archaic and invented languages, the Tea Club Barovian Society, after Barrow's Tea Rooms, which is where they met. Now, in your school, there may have been a geeky clique, but did you have a geeky clique dedicated to archaic and invented languages? These really were the uber geeks, but language and imagination a big part of Tolkien's life from a very young age and he had always sought out other people who were interested in these things so in October 1911 he began studying classics at Oxford but he changed to English language and literature in 1913 graduating with first class honours in 1915 so he did quite well we could say now while he had been under the guardianship of Father Morgan, he had fallen in love with a fellow lodger in the house where he was staying, Edith Bratt. She was 16 and he was 19. So Father Morgan thought it was a bit of a teenage crush and insisted that Tolkien finish his education and not to become engaged until he turned 21. Father Morgan was also keen to point out that Edith was not a Catholic, which was a real issue to him. Tolkien wrote to Edith the moment he turned 21 to propose. And Edith's landlord evicts her for being engaged to a Roman Catholic. So again, in Tolkien's life, he's experiencing some anti-Catholic sentiment. So Edith converted to Roman Catholicism and they were married on the 22nd of March, 1916. And very shortly afterwards, in June 1916, Tolkien is summoned to Folkestone for transportation to France during the Great War. And he wrote, junior officers were being killed off a dozen a minute. Parting from my wife then, it was like a death. So officers really were at great risk of never coming home. So Tolkien actually fought at the Somme. 
and he contracted trench fever and was treated in a military hospital. After the war, his first job was as a lexicographer for the Oxford English Dictionary. Now, when I was myself a medieval literature scholar, my tutor did not like it that I was taking an interest in Tolkien because that was not considered very academic at the time. And he said that if I insisted on becoming what he called a Tolkien expert, I could go and read the S section of the Oxford English Dictionary, which was one of the first academic jobs that J.R.R. Tolkien had, was creating the S section of the Oxford English Dictionary. So unless you've read that, you haven't read the entire works of Tolkien, although I'm sure it's been superseded by now. In 1920, he becomes reader in English language at the University of Leeds. And in 1925, he becomes a professor, not just a lecturer, a professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford. And he's really incredibly young to hold that post. So he's considered to be academically very gifted. W.H. Auden, who was a student of Tolkien's, wrote to him, I never told you what an unforgettable experience it was for an undergraduate hearing you recite Beowulf. The voice was the voice of Gandalf. So J.R.R. Tolkien, he's principally an academic, but he starts writing stories when he has children. And Tolkien had four children. John Francis Rule Tolkien, who was born in 1917, he became a priest. Michael Hillary Rule Tolkien, who was born in 1920, he was a war veteran. Christopher John Rule Tolkien, born in 1924, he's actually still alive and he only retired from the Tolkien estate in 2018 and he actually was responsible for editing a lot of his father's work and publishing it after his death and then Priscilla Mary Ann Rule Tolkien who was born in 1929 she also sits in the Tolkien estate and she was a social worker now all four of Tolkien's children went to Oxford including his daughter which in those days was a pretty cool thing so he wrote The Hobbit principally for his children. He didn't really have any thoughts of it being published. He also wrote something called the Father Christmas Letters. So in most families, children send letters to Santa. In the Tolkien family, they got letters back. And Father Christmas told them about his life with the elves and snowmen and what was going on in the North Pole. And they had no idea, apparently, that these letters were actually from their father until, as John Tolkien related, one night, he stubbed his toe whilst delivering these letters and went, damn! And when they heard his voice, the game was up and they knew the letters were from their father. Meanwhile, in Belfast, Clive Staples Lewis is born on the 29th of November, 1898. The son of solicitor Albert Lewis and Florence Nay Hamilton, daughter of a Church of Ireland minister. Now, people often ask, how do you get Jack? which is what C.S. Lewis was called, out of Clive Staples. And the answer is that when C.S. Lewis was three, very sadly, the family dog died. And the family dog had been called Jaxie. And for some reason after that, C.S. Lewis wouldn't respond to any other name than Jack. So that's how that happened. He had an elder brother. So he's the younger brother in his family, Warren Hamilton Lewis Warney. And they wrote anthropomorphic stories called Animal Land from quite a young age. So again, from a very young age, C.S. Lewis is interested in writing and in storytelling. When Lewis was seven, the family moved to the Little Lee, a house called Little Lee, in the Strand Town area of Belfast. Lewis's mother very sadly died of cancer in 1908 when he was 10 years old. So J.R.R. Tolkien had lost his mother at 12. So a very similar experience but they had very, very different reactions to the event. So you'll remember that Tolkien considered his mother to be a Catholic martyr. This is what C.S. Lewis wrote about his mother's death in Surprised by Joy. There came a night when I was ill and crying and distressed because my mother did not come to me. And then my father in tears came into my room and tried to convey to my terrified mind things it had never conceived before. My father never fully recovered from this loss. Under the pressure of anxiety, his temper became incalculable. He spoke wildly and acted unjustly. We were coming, my brother and I, to rely exclusively on each other for all that had made life bearable. Prayer hadn't worked, but I was used to things not working and thought no more about it. 
So Lewis and his brother were sent to the Wynyard School in Watford in Hertfordshire where he was very unhappy. In fact, even by the standards of the day, it was an abusive environment and the school closed when the headmaster of Wynyard was actually sent to a mental institution. So he came home to Belfast where he attended Campbell College for a short time and left due to illness. But it wasn't really the done thing for the Northern Irish middle classes to have their children educated in Northern Ireland at the time. They wanted their children to have nice plummy English accents. So the brothers are sent to Malvern, Worcestershire, for C.S. Lewis's health and they enrol at Sherberg House School, which was like a preparatory school, moving on to Malvern College in 1913. But they didn't stay there very long. C.S. Lewis wrote in Surprise by Joy how he didn't really fit into the social hierarchy there and his brother didn't really thrive academically there. So they're sent for private study to their father's old headmaster called William T. Kirkpatrick, who's known as the Old Knock. Now Lewis characterized the old knock in that hideous strength as McPhee, the atheist who's on God's side. And Kirkpatrick was very, very committed to logic. So if you had said to William Kirkpatrick, it's a cold day today, he would have said, really, is it cold? How do you know it's cold? Have you used a thermometer to make sure it's cold? And is it cold relative to what? Is it not colder in Siberia? So he didn't like sort of quickly passed remark, remarks or unresearched arguments. He was really dedicated to, to logic. And that was a, an academic stance that C.S. Lewis adopted basically for the rest of his life. Lewis was very widely read. He read the classics, he read Norse mythology. He also read moderns and romantics. And again, this figure of George MacDonald comes up. George MacDonald, quite unusually for his time, wrote fairy stories and fantasy works for adults because that was really considered to be the domain of children's literature at the time. So Lewis entered Oxford in 1917 and joined the Officers Training Corps and he arrived at the front line of the Somme on his 19th birthday. And in April 1918 he was wounded by a shell and which actually killed two people who were standing right next to him. So it was amazing that he survived and he had shrapnel wounds, which he basically had for the rest of his life. Very sadly, one of those two men who was killed was the sergeant of his unit, whom he was very close to, whom he actually described as a father figure. So he was in hospital for quite a long time after that and his father didn't come and visit him. He was actually in hospital for three months, but his father didn't want to come to England to visit his son because that would have been disruptive of his normal routine and he just wasn't a person who liked to have his routine disrupted. So he was demobilized in December 1918 and returns to Oxford where he received a first in honour moderations, which was Greek and Latin literature in 1920. He also received a first in greats, which was philosophy and ancient history in 1922 and a first in English in 1923. So I think it's safe to say he did rather well. So in 1924, he became a philosophy tutor at University College. And then in 1925, he was elected a fellow and tutor in English literature at Maudlin College. And he stayed there for 29 years until 1954. So his career moves into the realms of English literature because as you can see he had a choice of directions he could have gone in as an academic. The old knock had written to Lewis's father that he was really cut out to be an academic and nothing else. It was the only field that he was really going to thrive in and he really did thrive in that field. So this is the kilns, C.S. Lewis's famous house in Oxford. So Lewis had promised his friend Edward Paddy Moore that he would look after his mother after the war if he was killed. And very sadly, Paddy Moore was killed in the war. So Jane Moore was 45 and Lewis 18 after the war and Moore was separated from her husband. So she actually moved in and lived with C.S. Lewis who introduced her socially as his mother. Owen Barfield, who was a good friend of Lewis's and a member of the Inklings, believed the chances their relationship was sexual was about 50-50. Lewis refused to talk to even his brother or his closest friends about the relationship. You couldn't ask him about it. The only person he discussed it with was his childhood friend from Belfast, Arthur Greaves. But Greaves scored out the passages in letters that related to Jane Moore and he burned letters that were entirely about 
the relationship. So those no longer survive. Lewis lived with Moore, who was nicknamed Minto after some very popular sweets of the time, until her hospitalization in the late 1940s. And her daughter, Maureen, also lived in the house until her marriage. So it's a bit of a strange setup, sometimes described as a menage. So in the 1930s, Minto Lewis and Lewis's brother, Warney, moved in to the kilts. So this is... C.S. Lewis's reflection on life with Jane Moore. So he wrote this three months after her death. I have lived most of my life in a house which was hardly ever at peace for 24 hours amid senseless wranglings, lyings, backbitings, follies and scares. I never went home without a feeling of terror as to what appalling situation might have developed in my absence. Only now that it is over do I begin to realise quite how bad it was. So... John Bremner, who's writing an article about Jane Moore and C.S. Lewis, goes on to say, it might reasonably be wondered why Jack continued in the relationship. All that can be said is that he had made a commitment and that he thought it ought to be maintained. So he wrote to his brother in 1930, I have definitely chosen and I don't regret the choice. Whether I was right or wrong, wise or foolish, to have done so originally is now only an historical question. Once having created expectations, one naturally fulfills them. So he'd made a promise to Paddy Moore and he wasn't going to break it. Um, Warney Lewis cordially disliked Jane Moore and was quite honest about that in his diaries. So you can understand with this unhappy home life why C.S. Lewis spent so much time with friends like Tolkien and in the company of men and in the Inklings where he felt um, a relative peace that he didn't have at home. So let's look at the meeting of minds when Tolkien and Lewis met. What was their initial reaction to each other and how did that friendship grow? So it's a popular myth that the friendship of Tolkien and Lewis was based on mutual Christianity. But actually, as Colin Duriez points out, when Lewis first met Tolkien, the two had radically opposing worldviews. Tolkien was an old-fashioned supernaturalist who believed in the orthodox doctrines of Christianity since childhood. Lewis was at first staunchly opposed to idealism, and actually he would have classed himself as an atheist at that point in his life. So that is not what made them click. And it's kind of easy for us to realise what it was that brought these two men together. It was their experiences during the First World War. Tolkien wrote that by 1918, all but one of my close friends were dead. And of his school friends, C.S. Lewis wrote, Peace to them, Ypres and the Psalm ate up most of them. So in that generation, because of the carnage of the so-called war to end all wars, men of that generation were missing brothers, they were missing cousins, they were missing friends. They, they'd had these great losses. So actually, if you met a man of your own generation, that really was a friendship to be treasured. So Gordon Smith of the Tea Club Barovian Society, whom we talked about earlier on, had written to Tolkien, May God bless you, my dear John Ronald, and may you say the things I have tried to say long after I am no longer there to say them, if such be my lot. And Tolkien felt a responsibility to say those things and to convey the experiences of that generation. Now, Lewis and Tolkien's reactions to the war were slightly different. I mean, one biographer, Humphrey Carpenter, who wrote a biography of the Inklings, claims that C.S. Lewis didn't really have a reaction to the war. He, he didn't really worry about it too much. I think that that would have been impossible, you know, to have gone through what he'd gone through without being traumatised, but he just didn't refer to it in his works in the way that Tolkien did but that didn't mean that it wasn't an issue for him so he had been in a military hospital Tolkien had been in a military hospital they both lost their mothers young they shared quite a lot of similar traumas so Tolkien wrote in his diary friendship with Lewis compensates for so much and I think that we can understand where he was coming from where he wrote that and besides giving constant pleasure and comfort, has done me much good from the contact with a man at once honest, brave, intellectual, a scholar, a poet and a philosopher, and a lover, at least after a long pilgrimage, 
of our Lord. So Lewis, although he's asserting that he's an atheist himself, really Tolkien sees Lewis as a person on a pilgrimage, on a journey. And there's obviously aspects of Lewis's personality that he's drawn to. He calls him honest, brave, intellectual, a scholar, a poet, and a philosopher. So although they have different ways of seeing the world, they, they just click as personalities, which sometimes happens in human life. Lewis wrote about Tolkien. Friendship with Tolkien marked the breakdown of two old prejudices. At my first coming into the world, I had been implicitly warned never to trust a papist. And at my first coming into the English faculty, explicitly never to trust a philologist. Tolkien was both. So Lewis is here somewhat humorously pointing to the fact that, that actually Robert Havard had mentioned that these two men should never have been friends. You know, they were so different. It was completely unexpected. So we'll look a little bit at their family lives. Tolkien was a very devoted father. So you could see that from his letter that we read to his daughter. He began his writing career writing for his children. And when he writes to his children, he refers to them as dearest. And he tends to sign letters, your own dear and loving father. And he shows that he's very interested in the little details of their lives. And he shares his heart with his children. He tells them how he really feels about things. Lewis' relationship with his father was not a strong bond, so he is not seen a sort of functional father in his life. In fact, he said, everything invited us to develop a life which had no connection with our father. And it is a strange thing that having known me all my life, he should have known me so little. And he wrote that in Surprised by Joy. So let's hear from Tolkien and Lewis's families on what they were like to live with as a relative. So we'll start with Simon Tolkien talking about his grandfather. Creativity and being able to create something is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's what my grandfather thought. My grandfather thought that that was as, as close as you got to God as a, as a person as you could when you were creating things. And I, I kind of feel that. What is, what is your fondest memory of him? Or, your, or the fondest image you have when you think of him. Just he was actually really interested in me as a person, which is kind of unusual when I was, you know, I, he died when I was 14, and he would actually talk to me about what my experiences were like. You know, my parents were divorced when I was five, and we would walk along the beach at Bournemouth, and he was very understanding. I would go and stay with my grandparents on my own quite, quite often. People aged nine or ten took train journeys on their own in those days. And... Um, that was good. And then a lot of other sort of different memories. I mean, we played word games, and I asked him endless questions about Lord of the Rings, um, which I think were very difficult, because one of the reasons why the Lord of the Rings is so amazing is that you actually believe that it's what he's actually written is only a section of what he could have written. So C.S. Lewis actually came to be a stepfather into his 60s when he married Joy Davidman and he became stepfather to her two sons. Um, especially after her death, he became very close, especially to Douglas Gresham. So we'll hear Douglas Gresham describing his relationship with C.S. Lewis here. Well, the question is, what would it be like to grow up with C.S. Lewis? Let's find All right, let's see. <laughs> People see C.S. Lewis on the spines of books. Clive Staples Lewis, the great scholar, the great writer. But to me, he wasn't C.S. Lewis at all. He was just Jack. To us, to family, he was always Jack. He was a man who first became my friend and later my stepfather. And eventually Jack was the man I admired and respected and loved most in all the world. My brother and I first came to Oxford in 1953 when I was still eight years old. I was being taken to meet C.S. Lewis, the man who was on speaking terms with High King Peter of Narnia and Aslan the Great Lion, I kind of expected him to be wearing silver armour and carrying a sword and probably had a charger stabled out in the background somewhere. And instead, when I came through the back door of this house, the kilns, there was this balding, stooped, professorial-looking gentleman in the most shabby clothes you can imagine, and trod down at the heels, slippers, and nicotine-stained fingers and teeth. Jack looked very strange to me as an eight-year-old American boy. But soon... He became so much more. Now, 
C.S. Lewis wasn't quite as close to Douglas Gresham's brother, who embraced his mother's Jewish roots and um, sort of turned from the Christianity of C.S. Lewis, whereas Douglas Gresham, obviously, you know, saying he was one of the men that I admired most in my life, had a very close relationship to C.S. Lewis. So having had quite an unhappy family life and household life for a long time, um, things changed when he met Joy Davidman. Obviously, her death was devastating to C.S. Lewis, but he did then have two stepsons. So let's talk about Lewis's conversion to Christianity. He wrote that Dyson and Tolkien were the immediate human causes of my conversion. Is any pleasure on earth as great as a circle of Christian friends by a good fire? And that was probably Tolkien's biggest contribution to Lewis's life and to his literary works, his role in converting him to Christianity. So C.S. Lewis's initial stance was, the impression I got was that religion in general, though utterly false, was a kind of academic nonsense into which humanity tended to blunder. In the midst of a thousand religions stood our own, labelled true. But... On what grounds could I believe in this exception? So it's really Dyson and Tolkien who answer this question. So there was a famous late night walk taken by Tolkien, Hugo Dyson and C.S. Lewis when C.S. Lewis had invited Tolkien and Dyson over for dinner at his rooms in Oxford, basically until the wee small hours of the morning. I think it might actually have been 4 a.m. It says 3 a.m. here. Um, they talked about literature, about literature, not about religion. Now, Tolkien had this view, which you can see on the photograph here. We have come from God, and inevitably, the myths woven by us, though they contain error, will also reflect a splintered fragment of the true light, the eternal truth that is with God. So basically, God is the creator, Tolkien is a child of God, and so he also can create things, although not as perfectly. And he always referred to himself in the context of Middle Earth as the sub-creator. He would never let himself be known as the creator because in his mindset, God is the creator. So his way into his faith is through literature because literature is how human beings express this spiritual world and that was something that C.S. Lewis could really grasp. So Tolkien wrote a poem about that night called Myth Mythopoeia. Um, it's very, or Mythopia, it's very, very worth reading, very beautiful but in true Tolkien style it's a little long. Um, he wrote of that night, the heart of man is not compound of lies, but draws some wisdom from the only wise and still recalls him, though now long estranged. Man is not wholly lost nor wholly changed. Disgraced he may be, yet is not dethroned and keeps the rags of lordship once he owns his world dominion by creative act, not his to worship the great artifact. So that by creative act is important. Spirituality and creativity are very much linked in the world of Tolkien and then later of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis also wrote a poem based on the same experience, much more shorter to the point but packs a lot in, which is more his style. It's called What the Bird Said Early in the Year. Uh, which uh, says here, not coincidentally, it's set in Addison's Walk, which is where he was converted to the faith. And it has to do with a spell being undone. So, I heard in Addison's Walk a bird sing clear. This year the summer will come true. This year, this year. Winds will not strip the blossom from the trees. This year, nor want of rain destroy the peas. This year time's nature will no more defeat you, nor all the promised moments in their passing cheat you. This time they will not lead you round and back to autumn, one year older, by the well-worn track. This year, this year, as these flowers foretell, we shall escape the circle and undo the spell. Often deceived, yet open once again your heart. Quick, 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 the gates are drawn apart. So here's a little video that basically sums up Tolkien and Dyson's argument for Christianity that won over C.S. Lewis. Till finally, that night in 1931, he had invited Tolkien and Hugo Dyson, two of his closest friends, to Morton College. 
It's a windy night. They went along before dinner. They walked along Addison's Walk, talking about mythology. They stayed up to 4 a.m. and Tolkien did his work well. What Tolkien showed me was this, that if I met the idea of sacrifice in a pagan story, I didn't mind it at all. I was mysteriously moved by it. The reason was that in pagan stories, I was prepared to feel the myth as profound. Now the story of Christ is simply a true myth. His imaginative questionings and his imaginative longings came together by focusing upon the, the Christian Gospels as um, outlined by Tolkien and, and Dyson. But Lewis didn't follow Christianity in the same mould that Tolkien did. He actually became an Anglican like his mother's family and that disappointed Tolkien, who was obviously Catholic and would have liked C.S. Lewis to join the same church as him. Because despite the fact they met up three times a week in work and socially, he would have liked that fourth time a week at church on Sunday. So Lewis was actually much more liberal in his views than Tolkien. And we can see that when he writes an essay advocating that there should be soluble state-sponsored marriage and indissoluble Christian marriage as two separate entities. So in other words, he's advocating something which we might think of as being um, a sort of civil partnership and then a marriage is a separate thing. So Tolkien's horrified by this. He was very conservative on the issue of marriage and wrote to him, I have been reading your booklet, Christian Behaviour. I have never felt happy about your view of Christian policy with regard to divorce. On the surface, your policy seems to be reasonable, and it is at any rate the system under which Roman Catholics already live. But I should like to point out that your opinion in your booklet is based on an argument that shows a confusion of thought discoverable from that booklet itself. So the last thing you want to be accused of as an academic is confusion of thought. Now that's a draft letter written in 1943. Um, I'm not sure that was ever actually sent, but it shows that Tolkien and Lewis, despite both being Christians, don't always see the world, you know, in exactly the same way. So, of course, what these two men had in common was exploring and inventing literary worlds. That's why we've heard of them. That's why they're famous. So we've talked a little bit about how both Tolkien and Lewis saw literature and spirituality and you know, being very much bound up that storytelling is a way of describing both your external and internal world. So here we see a quote by Tolkien where he said, the resurrection was the greatest eucatastrophe possible in the greatest fairy story and produces that essential emotion, Christian joy, which produces tears because it is qualitatively so like sorrow, because it comes from those places where joy and sorrow are at once reconciled as selflessness and altruism are lost in love. So this idea of a eucatastrophe, um, which was a uh, word coined by Tolkien, Tolkien um, which Lewis actually quotes in Surprise by Joy. And it's basically the idea that in, in sort of Greek drama, you have the idea of a catastrophe, which is some event which puts everything on a bad course so that you have this sort of Eden-like state, everything's okay, and then a catastrophe comes and that sort of kicks off the story. You catastrophe is when that catastrophe is resolved and everything suddenly goes right where, which Tolkien believed happened in life, but not often in art. So that's one of the key principles of his writing, something he strongly believed in. So the two most important literary viewpoints shared by C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien were combining imagination and rationalism. Now, in our modern age, in the age of, say, Richard Dawkins, anything imaginative is considered a little bit dodgy, that that's going to take you away from thinking logically and rationally. And um, Lewis and Tolkien obviously didn't think like that. They believed you could be an intellectual and an academic and actually feed and cultivate your imagination at the same time and anti-modernism. So modernism, again, um, it's moved 
we've moved further down the line from what modernism was in Lewis and Tolkien's day, but you can see Tolkien here saying, living by faith includes the call to something greater than cowardly self-preservation. They saw modernism as being about self-preservation. And it also devalues things that were important to them. It devalues things like faith, but it also devalues art and literature in that it says, all that is useful to humanity are those areas of human study that and those disciplines that add to our biological survival so that would be you know medicine engineering those are useful whereas creative things not so much and naturally they rejected that viewpoint so Duriez wrote Lewis and Tolkien increasingly saw themselves as against the modern spirit against modernism both as a literary movement and more deeply as an intellectual stance they shared a mission against the zeitgeist and that is why Lewis and Tolkien are such intriguing characters within popular culture in that they are are actually intellectually diametrically opposed to the popular culture in which they're such huge figures they were also really inspired by northern mythology now after the second world war northern european stories you know unfortunately the way they were appropriated by the nazis makes us uncomfortable with them and Tolkien especially wanted to claim that heritage back um, Lewis wrote about the ring cycle and listening to Wagner pure northernness engulfed me the memory of joy itself so he loved that literature Tolkien said I have in this war a burning private grudge against that ruddy little ignoramus Adolf Hitler ruining perverting misapplying and making forever accursed that noble northern spirit a supreme contribution to Europe which I have ever loved and tried to present in its true light so in the Lord of the Rings Tolkien is trying to wrest northern mythology back from the Nazis you'll also notice here that he believes Adolf Hitler to be uh, basically demonically possessed so he believes that the Second World War has been a spiritual battle between good and evil and that is very much seen in the Lord of the Rings which is basically a battle between good and evil now some people find that to be a reductive worldview and I think if you look at something like Game of Thrones which really displays a 21st century attitude to evil a little bit more where people are both good and evil um, at the same time and each side in the war has good and evil people on it and um, obviously that's not the way Tolkien's writing and that's not the way that he's seeing the world so another big influence we've talked about him before and now let's find out a bit more about him this is George MacDonald I realize he looks a little bit like Rasputin so he was a major influence of both Tolkien and Lewis because he wrote fairy tales for adults. Now, in our day, we're used to fantasy writing. We have Narnia, we have The Lord of the Rings, we have the Marvel and DC Comics universes, we have Star Wars. You know, adults are entertained by fantasy. That wasn't really the case so much in Tolkien and Lewis's day. And actually, after the Enlightenment, sort of fantastical stories were not considered intellectual i mean if you look at the ancient world the sort of classics of the ancient world things like the odyssey the aeneid you know in history fantastic stories were considered to be literature beowulf obviously um, a work of literature and you know that was not so much around the time of tolkien and lewis so they loved mythology and those kind of stories so finding someone who was writing fairy tales for adults was a bit of a find for both of them now George MacDonald was an author a poet a Christian minister and an apologist but he was a Christian universalist so he didn't feel that only some people were chosen by God he felt anyone could be saved by God and he came from Calvinist Scotland so his theology was a bit out of favor so C.S. Lewis even at the point where he didn't believe in God was just blown away by the writing of George MacDonald and wrote on reading fantasties that night my imagination was in a certain sense baptized the rest of me are not unnaturally took longer I had not the faintest notion what I had let myself in for for buying fantasties which is a work by George McDonald's which um, Lewis is basically saying changed his life so these were the days of the Bloomsbury set that really wasn't Lewis and Tolkien's kind of story that they like to read 
So C.S. Lewis remarked to Tolkien, if they won't write the kind of books we like to read, we shall have to write them ourselves. So they had a little bit of a wager going where Lewis was to write about space travel and Tolkien was to write about time travel. So Lewis wrote the Cosmic Trilogy and Tolkien didn't really carry it out, but he sort of tried to argue that the Lord of the Rings was sort of time travel, which was a bit tenuous, but it really was Tolkien's sort of tendency to start things off and not finish them. So Lewis and Tolkien, as personalities, clearly supported and encouraged each other in their writing. So Tolkien said in Lewis, the unpayable debt that I owe to him was not influence, but sheer encouragement. He was for long my only audience. So Tolkien would read things that he had been writing to C.S. Lewis because he trusted his judgment. And Lewis said of reading The Lay of Lathian, which later became the, became the Lay of Luthien, I can honestly say it is ages since I had an evening of such delight, and the personal interest of reading a friend's work had very little to do with it. The two things that came out clearly are the sense of reality and the mythical value. So they could also criticize each other quite harshly. They, they weren't always bigging each other up, but um, clearly they listened to each other's work. They passed comment. They had input into each other's work. And actually C.S. Lewis wrote a review of The Hobbit when it was first published in the Times Literary Supplement, which wasn't considered to be nepotism in those days when you're writing about a friend's work, that really did get it out there. So you know, he was a big proponent of Tolkien's work. Tolkien, on the other hand, he really didn't like the Narnia books. And we'll find out why in just a moment. He, he wasn't a fan of everything that Lewis wrote. And, and unfortunately, he really hated the screw tape letters. And what was unfortunate about that was that the screw tape letters were dedicated to him. So, a bit sad. They actually made each other characters in each other's work. So as we mentioned earlier, Lewis is characterized in The Lord of the Rings as Treebeard, who's a long-winded ant with a booming voice. And it's a mark of backhanded affection. So let's remind ourselves of Treebeard. You know, little family of being mice that climb up sometimes and they tickle me awfully. I'm always trying to get something with it. Many of these trees were my friends, creatures I had known from nut and acorn. I'm sorry, Treebeard. They had voices of their own. Sharon, the wizard should know better. No! So if you compare that to the voice of C.S. Lewis that we heard towards the start of this video, you can see there's similarities there. And again, trees represent spirituality. They are part of the Eden myth um, in the work of J.R.R. Tolkien. So characterizing C.S. Lewis as a tree shows that C.S. Lewis and Tolkien's life really stands for his sort of core values and his spirituality. And again, Tolkien stands for Lewis's core values in the Ransom Trilogy, or the Cosmic Trilogy, as it's also known, or the Space Trilogy. Um, the protagonist is called Elwyn Ransom, and Elwyn means elf lover in Old English. And Elwyn Ransom is a Cambridge philologist, as opposed to an Oxford philologist, but there's some real obvious parallels there, which Tolkien recognized. He says, as a philologist, I may have some part in Ransom and recognize some of my opinions Lewisified in him. So Colin Duriez writes, Ransom's kidnapper represents all that Lewis disliked about the modernist world. His guiding value is biological survival. Ransom embodied what the friends viewed as the contrasting old perennial values common to humanity. So He's using a figure based on Tolkien to represent his core values, which, you know, 
is pretty significant. Um, when we get to That Hideous Strength, the last book in the trilogy, the protagonist of That Hideous Strength is much more based on Charles Williams than J.R.R. Tolkien. By that stage, um, Lewis had become very close to Williams. That put Tolkien's nose well out of joint and also Charles Williams had um, some views and ways of seeing the world and ways of looking at art, at art that didn't sit well with Tolkien and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So the thorny issue of allegory. I mentioned that Lewis, um, I don't know that he was hurt by Tolkien's dislike of the Narnia Chronicles but Tolkien never made a secret about not really being a fan because he wasn't a fan of allegory. He wrote in the preface to the second edition of The Lord of the Rings, I cordially dislike allegory in all its manifestations. I think that many confuse applicability with allegory, but the one resides in the freedom of the reader and the other in the purposed domination of the author. In other words, it's too heavy handed. Now, he wasn't actually talking about Narnia here. He was talking about some people's interpretation of the Lord of the Rings as being an allegory of the Second World War, which was something that Tolkien didn't really like. But Lewis didn't see his work as allegory. He said the Narnian series is not exactly allegory. Rather, supposing the Narnian world, let us guess what form the activities of a creator, redeemer or judge might take there. This, you see, overlaps with allegory, but is not quite the same thing. Um, so I will leave it to you whether you think that is the case or not. He's in essence here saying even in the secondary world that he's created, you know, God has to be in the secondary world as well as in the real world. And he would have the same role there as he would have in our world. So that's not allegory. So uh, I'll let you make up your own mind about that. So we've talked repeatedly about this literary group that both Tolkien and Lewis were members of the Inklings. And you can see Charles Williams, who we, we've talked a bit about there. So. They met every Tuesday lunchtime at the Eagle and Child in Oxford. If you're ever in Oxford, go there. They do great fish and chips. And you can see the little booth where the inkling sat. And it is tiny. And once they brought out all their papers and their books, they must have been elbowing each other in the ribcage to sit in the little space where they sat. And Thursday evenings, they met at Lewis's rooms in Magdalen College. So C.S. Lewis was very much the leader. He invited people to join. He brought people together. J.R.R. Tolkien was another famous member. Now, famous now, back in those days of the Inklings, it was Lewis who was the celebrity. The Lord of the Rings had not yet taken off to the extent that it one day would um, when it was picked up in America. So Tolkien is, is not a celebrity at that stage. Warney Lewis also attended and read. Hugo Dyson. Um, he caused a bit of offence to Tolkien by vetoing the ring, reading of The Lord of the Rings by saying, not another fucking elf, just got fed up of it. Tolkien had his revenge, though, because one night Lewis was reading from a book about hell entitled Who Goes Home? And Tolkien suggested it should be retitled Who Goes Home? Another member was Owen Barfield. He was an anthroposophist. Um, which is very difficult to say, in the sort of Rudolf Steiner school, his philosophical arguments with C.S. Lewis are described in detail in Surprise by Joy. And he was responsible for bringing C.S. Lewis to a theist viewpoint. And then, of course, Dyson and Tolkien were part of his con eventual conversion to Christianity. So Charles Williams, let's talk about the figure that is Charles Williams. He was the author of novels, plays and poetry. And Lewis loved The Place of the Lion, which is one of his works, which people wonder was that uh, an influence on The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. He was actually fascinated by the occult and his work included an element of sexual sadism. Now, you can imagine how much the ultra conservative J.R.R. Tolkien liked that. His close friendship with Lewis actually put Tolkien's nose right out of joint. He didn't like it, although they did on occasions meet on their own without Lewis. It wasn't that Tolkien hated him so much he wouldn't be in the same room as him, but he wasn't a fan. So after peace was announced at the end of the Second World War, 
the Inklings were planning on going away for a holiday to celebrate. Everyone was planning how they were going to party. So they were having a meeting to discuss arranging this. And it was noticed that C.S. Lewis and Warney Lewis were lit. And they were never lit. They were always the first people there. People wondered what had happened. And then the Lewis brothers came in and announced that just the day after um, the Second World War had ended, Charles Lewis had actually died. And after his death, C.S. Lewis... Um, sort of consulted his memory about a lot of things. He was a sort of quasi spirit guide to um, C.S. Lewis. And as mentioned before, he very much influenced that hideous strength. So there were others who attended on an occasional basis. There was Robert Havard, Lewis's doctor, whom everyone referred to as the useless quack. Affectionately, I'm sure. Christopher Tolkien, Younger generation came in along every now and then, Austin Farrer, and a very interesting figure called Roy Campbell. Now, he didn't come along in friendship the first time he attended. So let's look at the day Roy Campbell first turned up. Now, Roy Campbell was a poet from a Protestant Northern Irish family, similar background to C.S. Lewis, but he was living in South Africa and he had converted to Catholicism. Now, he had hidden Carmelite priests who were being massacred by communists in Spain and later fought on Franco's side in the Spanish Civil War. So that led to accusi accusations of fascism because, you know, he fought for Franco, but actually that was because of the Carmelite massacres. And he later fought against the fascist Hitler with the British. I think we would possibly be reading his poetry at school here in Northern Ireland had it not been this association with fascism. Also, when you see memes going around Facebook by the likes of Ricky Gervais saying that atheist people don't kill their ideological enemies, that the Carmelite massacres are something to look up um, when you read those things. It was horrible. Priests were being slaughtered um, and he felt that he had to do something. So C.S. Lewis had attacked Roy Campbell acerbically in the Oxford magazine. He'd actually called him a loud fool. Not very nice. So he knew that the Inklings met in the Eagle and Child and he decided he was just going to turn up with an axe to grind. So J.R.R. Tolkien tells us what happens next in a letter to his son Christopher. There is a good deal of Ulster left in CSL, if hidden from himself. After that, things became fast and furious, and I was late for lunch. Must have been bad. C.S. Lewis had taken a good deal of port and was a little belligerent. Insisted on reading out his lampoon again while R.C. laughed at him, but we were mostly obliged to listen to the guest. CSL's reactions were odd, but hatred of our church is, after all, the real only final foundation of the C of E. CSL, for instance, reveres the blessed sacrament and admires none. Yet if a Lutheran is put in jail, he is up in arms. But if Catholic priests are slaughtered, he disbelieves it. Brackets, I dare say, really thinks they asked for it. But R.C. shook him up a bit. So here we see a crack in the friendship between Lewis and Tolkien. Tolkien perceives Lewis as having an anti-Catholic sentiment. Now, how fair that is, I can't comment on. I know that, that Warney and Jack Lewis sometimes use words to describe Catholic people that a Northern Irish person of my generation would be uncomfortable with, although they're careful not to do this around Tolkien. And there is an argument that said, says, if Lewis really was an anti-Catholic bigot, why was he friends with the ultra-Catholic Tolkien in the first place? But um, he, Tolkien had experienced real anti-Catholic feeling in his young life and maybe was oversensitive. I can't really draw a conclusion about you know, how fair these criticisms are. It so happened though that Lewis and Roy Campbell buried the hatchet and Roy Campbell actually became an occasional member of the Inklings, which was interesting because he had been associated with the Bloomsbury set who had a very, very different worldview, obviously, and he, he came to the occasional meeting. So Happy ending for Lewis and Campbell. Um, real issue there for Lewis and Tolkien. Now, like all friends, they did like to insult each other and they did have the odd row. So we're going to look at some of the best insults here, including full frontal attacks, backhanded compliments, peak and exasperation. So we'll start with my very favourite insult. Um, as we know, Ransom is really Tolkien. And Lewis describes Ransom as a member of the intelligentsia, 
on holiday. Really well crafted insult that one. Tolkien is a bit more direct. Writing to Christopher Tolkien, he says, I have just received a copy of CSL's latest. Alas, his ponderous silliness is becoming a fixed manner. I am deeply relieved to find that I am not mentioned. And why might he expect to be mentioned? He was mentioned in the Scree Tip letters. I was wryly amused to be told by the Daily Telegraph Lewis himself was never fond of the Scree Tip letters. His bestseller dedicated to me. Now I know why. So Lewis called Tolkien the most unmanageable man in conversation I ever met. Bit of exasperation there. And he also called him that great but dilatory and unmethodical man. That would have been frustrating to C.S. Lewis, who was very to the point, very methodical, very logical in his approach to things. The most impressionable of men. That was Tolkien on Lewis. And really that remark was in relation to Lewis's friendship with Charles Williams. Because in Tolkien's way of saying things, Lewis just couldn't see through Charles Williams. Now, on occasions, real, actual hurt was caused. Um, this is an excerpt from a letter from Tolkien to C.S. Lewis. And it's actually a very painful letter to read. A situation had arisen where Tolkien had actually made quite a sharp criticism of some of Lewis's writing at the Inkling. And on this occasion, C.S. Lewis had obviously you know, properly taken offence. Tolkien writes, my dear Jack. And actually, he didn't often refer to C.S. Lewis as Jack. More often, he called him Lewis. So this was, you know, affection. It was good of you to write in return, but you write largely on offence, though surely I amended offend in my letter to pained. Pained, we cannot help being at the painful. I knew well enough that you would not allow pain to grow into resentment, not even if, or less still because, that might be a tendency of your nature. I regret causing pain for you, for whom I have deep affection and sympathy with a victim and I myself the culprit. But I felt myself tingling under the half patronising, half mocking lash. And then he goes on to describe how he does he isn't really a natural literary critic because he has less of a broad knowledge than Lewis does. He's very specialised in one field, whereas Lewis was a bit more of a polymath. But God is the only just literary critic. So he finishes, let us then bekenna either other to Christ, Old English for let us call one another to Christ, God keep you. And then of course he closes, but I warn you, if you bore me, I shall take my revenge. Yours, J-R-R-T. Now there's an interesting little moment in this letter where he says, you know, I've read this over and I've, I've left it a couple of days and I've decided whether or not I should send this to you. And I think I will. I think it's okay. Just interesting because today they probably would have just had a massive row on WhatsApp and never spoken again. So despite the odd bust up, they were generally very loyal to each other. Um, for example, Tolkien insisted on Lu using a quote by Lewis for the dust jacket of the Lord of the Rings, although both his publisher and Lewis himself warned, it, warned him that it might actually damage sales. Tolkien voted for Lewis for the Merton Chair of Medieval Literature and um, when he was rejected for the post, Lewis said, the only distressing thing about this affair is that my friends seem to be upset. So they very much supported each other and were loyal to each other. Tolkien wrote to Anne Barrett after C.S. Lewis's death that CSL, of course, had some oddities and could sometimes be irritating. He was, after all, remained an Irishman of Ulster. Ooh, says Northern Irish person reading that. But he was generous minded on guard against all prejudices, though a few were too deep rooted in his background to be observed by him. I wish it could be forbidden that after a great man is dead, little men should scrabble over him who have not and must know they have not sufficient knowledge of his life and character to give them any key to the truth. So what Tolkien is asserting here is, I may criticise C.S. Lewis, but I actually knew him and I knew him well. And that is fair enough. So we can see some cracks in this friendship. Now, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien never stopped speaking to each other. They never had an enormous fight, but their friendship did cool off. So let's have a little look at why that might have been. So after 
Lewis had died, Tolkien writes to his son Michael, many people still regard me as one of his intimates. Alas, that ceased to be the case 10 years ago. We were separated at first by the sudden apparition of Charles Williams and then by his marriage, of which he never even told me. I learned of it long after the event. But we owed each a great debt to the other and that tie with the deep affection it begot remains. So although the friendship was not what it once was, they were both still very important to each other. They were part of each other's life stories, really. And we see here, as well as the apparition of Charles Williams, Lewis's marriage is a little bit of an issue. So Lewis himself wrote, I never expect to have in my 60s the happiness that passed me by in my 20s. He met um, Joy David Gresham, who was an American novelist and poet, after they had had um, a correspondence and she unfortunately had an alcoholic ex-husband and was going through a divorce now under american law at the time that meant that she couldn't own any property so you know she really could have been destitute so in order to save her from this c.s lewis married her and it was a civil ceremony it wasn't a spiritual thing that happened on the 23rd of april 1956 so he didn't tell his friends that he had done that. Um, the wedding was a secret. And Tolkien, in learning of it, described the marriage as strange. So they had started out as intellectual companions, but as they lived together, they gradually fell in love. And then very sadly, Joy was diagnosed with terminal bone cancer. And then they had a Christian ceremony in hospital on the 21st of March, 1957. After much prayer, um, her cancer went into remission for three years, which really wasn't actually expected, but sadly it came back and she died on the 13th of July, 1960. At that point, C.S. Lewis wrote A Grief Observed, but he wrote it under a pseudonym. And ironically, some of his friends suggested that he read the book saying they thought it would really help him. Now, we have seen that J.R.R. Tolkien had some very con conservative views on marriage and you know an article on about.com under the atheism section suggests that it's those ultra conservative Christian views that drove the friends apart that may be true but we can also see that at the time they became friends C.S. Lewis was living with the separated Jane Moore and that didn't stop them from becoming friends and we can see that Tolkien's reaction to his son's divorce was to be supportive to his grandson so it may or may not have been the case, but Reverend Murray, a friend of the Tolkien family, actually said that J.R.R. Tolkien took Lewis's marriage personally. Um, and I think what he meant by that was that he had seen himself as Lewis's intellectual companion, and now somebody else is filling that role. And also, this was a really close friend who gets married without telling him. And so he was just sort of emotionally a little bit hurt and had his nose put out of joint by the whole thing. And um, Joy Davidman, you know, coming into the very male dominated sphere of the Inklings and of the Oxford of that era, you know, that could have been a little difficult for her. She obviously navigated those waters really well. And it was great, you know, that a woman was thrown into the mix because you know, with the inkling, C.S. Lewis did have um, intellectual relationships with women. Elizabeth Ansell, of course, absolutely crushed him at the Oxford Socratic Society. But, you know, he was basically surrounded by men in an academic and intellectual sphere. And it's great that this woman comes in. So there's this great tragedy in the life of C.S. Lewis. And then, unfortunately, there followed a great tragedy in the life of J.R.R. Tolkien when that axe blow fell. So this is the grave under the larch tree. And you see the quote here, men must endure their going hence. That is a quote from Shakespeare. C.S. Lewis' mother had had a calendar which had a Shakespeare quotation every day. And that was the quotation on the day that she died, which is then put on the grave of both her sons. So here are Christopher and Priscilla Tolkien describing their father's grief at the loss of C.S. Lewis. The profound attachment and imaginative intimacy between him and Lewis was, I think, in some ways, the 
the real core of it. Certainly, it, it was of profound importance to my father, that, that relationship. Indeed, to both of them. The fact that they drifted apart in their um, later on, I think myself, is, it was sad. But I think I would say that it was no more than a drifting apart. I don't think myself that it really requires to be studied in, in depth. I think what I should concentrate on was the extraordinary support of mind, of taste, that they offered each other. I think he felt that he owed a very great deal to Lewis in his encouragement of him as a writer. And I think he did say, and certainly conveyed this, that but for Lewis's encouragement when things were difficult, he might never have got the Lord of the Rings complete. So I think he felt an enormous debt to him there, and they mutually gave each other a great, great encouragement over their writings. I think that it was the most tremendous grief and blow when, when Lewis died, even though in the years preceding Lewis's death, following Lewis's marriage, and also after his move to Cambridge, they'd not met regularly and they'd seen very little of each other, and there was a lessening of the bond, a loosening of the bonds, and a loss of what my father would call the communion between them. But nonetheless, I think the memory was always there, and the affection remained. Um, in a letter he wrote to me, which is in response to a letter I wrote to him of sympathy after Lewis's death, he said that he had the normal feelings of, um, of a man of his age who feels he's losing his leaves one by one but that Lewis's death felt like an axe being taken to the roots, which I think is expresses far more than anything else what he must have felt. With Lewis's encouragement, Tolkien persevered with the enormous task of completing the Lord of the Rings. So Lewis had begun suffering from inflammation of the kidneys in June 1961, and he died on the 22nd of November 1963 at the age of 64 and he happened to die on the same day that Kennedy was assassinated. So in the 1970s after Lewis's death the Lord of the Rings became unexpectedly successful in the USA which made Tolkien a wealthy celebrity. That's when the juggernaut of the Lord of the Rings really took off and, and it was an incredibly sad thing that Lewis did not live to see the huge success of the book which he had enabled his friend to finish and to which he had contributed so much. Without Lewis, Tolkien was unable to complete his magnum opus, The Silmarillion, and it was published just in fragmented form by Christopher Tolkien after Tolkien's death. In fact, after Lewis died, Tolkien published only one short story. Um, he and Edith moved to Bournemouth after Tolkien's retirement um, and after she died he was given rooms in Oxford and he died on the 2nd of September 1973 aged 81 so he survived C.S. Lewis by about a decade. He had said that deep roots are not reached by the frost and the very deep roots of his friendship with C.S. Lewis continued to grow and it became this huge tree in popular culture that we still have today. So their symp simpatico just continued to live on after both of their deaths. And to me, the work of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien has this effect in popular culture.
So C.S. Lewis wrote, Those are the golden seasons, when our slippers are on, our feet spread out towards the blaze, and our drinks at our elbows, when the whole world, and something beyond the world, opens itself to our minds as we talk, while at the same time an affection mellowed by the years enfolds us. Life, natural life, has no better gift to give. Who could have deserved it?